Jonathan, that was incredibly helpful in sort of getting the big picture of the issues that we're going to talk about. A lot of what we're doing today is looking at these different questions of freedom to innovate, freedom to tinker, freedom to experiment, freedom to hack from a bunch of different perspectives. We're now moving into a section of the program where rather than being very abstract, we're actually going to be very concrete. Uh, and rather than giving you any details about the talks that are coming up, I'm just gonna introduce the speakers and let them tell their stories. Uh, first, we're gonna be joined by Star Simpson. Uh, Star was a student at the MIT Media Lab 2006 through 2010. That's all I'm gonna say, except that we're absolutely thrilled to have her here. Welcome, Star. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here at the Freedom to Innovate Summit. Um, MIT is a very special place and it's amazing to be back. Um, many of you know me or know that my name is Star Simpson at least. I will go into a little bit more detail about uh, why I'm here. Um, so, you know, it's been a long journey for me to come to Boston. I grew up in uh, the smallest, uh, one of the smallest US states. I grew up in the 50th, uh, Hawaii, and I was not surrounded by very much technology there. My parents are both artists, and they ran a humble two-person jewelry business when I was growing up. So no part of my coming here uh, was taken by me as given. But I knew um, that even though I grew up in a place that is, for many, a paradise, uh, I wanted, for some reason, to leave and go do things in the bigger world. Um, so what I did was I spent all of my time learning by uh, teaching myself, by reading, by uh, learning, by doing, by participating in projects. And at some point along the way, um, I heard about a place called MIT. Uh, I probably was about eight years old at the time, maybe 1996. But with nothing more than those three letters, I decided to look it up on the internet to find out more. And of course, MIT had a website for me to find. What I found there was a promise. A promise that out there was a place where if you wanted to learn the technical skills to change the world uh, through building something, that MIT was that place. Um, so I went through high school. I involved myself in any interesting project I could. Um, I worked on building one of the largest Wi-Fi networks in the world, for example, covering a couple hundred square miles. I played with what at the time were interesting emerging technologies, um, a new software concept called a wiki, for example. That was pretty cool. Um, so I couldn't believe it when I was actually invited to come and join um, the people here in Cambridge, uh, who I wanted nothing more than to work with, to collaborate with, and to join in building uh, the future. Uh, I would say as a side note, uh, I wouldn't, you know, my, my generation wasn't so much promised flying cars, as is often said um, by people like Peter Thiel, for example, uh, as I would say wearable electronics, 3D printers, and global information freedom through the internet. So those were the sort of things I hoped to dedicate myself to. Um, so when I arrived, I wanted to learn everything as much as possible. I wanted to taste it all, uh, and I wanted to get my hands dirty. And before my first week of classes even began, I was exploring the communities available on campus and came across a small student group called MITERS. Um, MITERS is a tiny but richly creative group um, that centers around uh, basically a, a machine shop, uh, but it's a place where anyone is welcome who wishes to convert their ideas into prototypes, who wants to learn to build things. Um, if you find MITERS, you are welcome to you know, set up shop and build what you might imagine there. And to me, it's one of the few places on campus that keeps alive the spirit of a older building, uh, Building 20, which stood here on campus for quite a long time. It was built uh, as a wartime temporary structure to house physicists who were going to work on developing the technology the United States would need to win the war, and ended up uh, creating fundamental breakthroughs uh, in understanding microwaves, uh, in radar, and the building ended up standing for 55 years. It was famous as a place of, you know, 
cramped quarters, uh, not being very well built, uh, you know, as you'd expect from any building that was intended to last for four years and stood for 55. Um, but it was a place where you could come and develop ideas. Um, it was eventually demolished, but Miters was actually created there and uh, moved to a small building now just north of campus. Um, and, uh, you know, I immersed myself there. I was also fortunate to join the Media Lab as an undergrad uh, researcher as a Europe here. Um, and I found a research group here that was similarly engaged in productive and creative pursuits. And I uh, joined people I looked up to immensely in working on exciting new projects. For example, my grad student advisor, Jeff Lieberman, Jeff Lieberman and I paired up to build um, what at the time was pretty cutting edge. We set out to build a wearable garment that would sense your posture, taking advantage of the brand, the newly low cost accelerometers and microcontrollers that uh, then new smartphones were driving. And it really felt like we were building something that no one else in the world had at the time. This is before wearables, um, this is before fitness trackers were a thing. And so I would come here to work, and I felt like I was creating something that nobody else had, um, something that was brand new, which is as research should feel. So then with the knowledge of how to build wearables, these things I'd always dreamed might be possible, and the confidence to build them, I decided that I wanted one of my own. I wanted to take something out of the lab that I could have for myself that wouldn't be you know, as polished, but it was something that I could have for myself. Um, and I wanted, as well, a garment that would change as I, being an electrical engineering student, learned and learned how to do bigger and cooler things. I also wanted something that would help me take advantage of the community I was part of, uh, something that would invite others to collaborate and build with me so that I could learn from my peers. Um, so it came to me that what I wanted was sort of to become a walking, I don't know, open hardware circuit wiki, right? Something where anyone could participate and build something that was really cool. So I went about um, building that, and um, I have to ask, does everybody know what a breadboard is? Okay, so a breadboard, um, for those who don't, um, mixed show of hands, uh, a breadboard is the ultimate uh, prototyping platform for building electronics. So if you want to make, you know, to try out some hardware idea very quickly, you'll grab a breadboard and build it there. So I took a breadboard and basically attached it to a garment I could wear every day. I took a sweatshirt and I sewed one to the other um, in order to create this thing I had in my mind. Um, a lot of people here, will be familiar with sort of what happened next as a matter of public record. But I think there are more details that have never really been expressed to, uh, that I'd like to share. Um, for the first week, um, I wore it around campus and uh, I can't really tell you what it's like to suddenly be popular uh, at MIT. I, I'd never really received compliments on my outfit, but Everyone, you know, so many people I ran into were like, you know, that's really cool. Uh, some stranger at one point told me that I should sell that garment at the student center here. Um, it was just a groundswell of positivity and people who thought that this like open hardware circuit wiki thing was like kind of neat, um, which was surprising and really gratifying. Um, I had grand visions for it. I thought maybe my friends would help me become, uh, you know, maybe like a walking, low power FM radio station and I could walk around campus and like broadcast and that would be awesome. Um, or that maybe the next week I would change my mind and have something that displayed information about the weather using LEDs perhaps. Um, it seemed like the possibilities were endless and I was so hopeful for what people you know, would uh, come together and build. I had no idea what would happen. Um, but after about a week of going around on campus with my like breadboard, people were like, yeah, it's cool. And I was like, so you want to build something? But like most wikis, <laughs> um, people just kind of looked at it and moved on um, rather than digging in to participate. So I thought, okay. People kind of get it, but they need to see what's possible. I should start out by you know, creating some very simple way to demonstrate this idea. I will build, I don't know, the simplest circuit I could imagine. Just, you know, some LEDs, whatever, right? Like, 
you know, the fastest thing you could build, spend no more than half an hour and go. So um, I took a break after my intro circuits class, um, which that year had incidentally cut out its practical lab component. Um, and I trucked up to miters, grabbed a little constellation of 13 LEDs, and arranged them in the shape of a star, um, for obvious reasons. Uh, anyway, um, I, then I had a jacket that, you know, not only had a breadboard on it, which people recognized, but also sort of showed that you could actually physically build things. And um, it was pretty neat, honestly. It was pretty cool. Um, not only did, you know, people ask, you know, why is the star? It was like, oh, my name is Star. Hey, good to meet you. You know, it was this conversation thing. Uh, it also served as a pretty good way to, uh, you know, illuminate me as I biked at night across the Harvard Bridge. Um, it was very functional, um, <laughs> and I, I loved it, to be honest. Um, and I'll take a note here to say that uh, MIT's motto is mens et manus, um, mind and hand. And these things have always gone together, and they always will, because it's not enough to think of an idea. You must also be able to practically affect it. Um, so, you know, of course, I'm not actually here because um, everybody loved my sweatshirt and it took off and was wildly popular. And now you can actually go to Gap and buy one. <laughs> That's not why I'm here. Um, what I didn't see was, um, I didn't see my project through the eyes of people who were traumatized and looking for terrorists. I didn't see my project um, through, you know, um, the eyes of someone who maybe has let their life be defined by fear. Um, and I grew up in Hawaii, so um, I looked just like everybody else where I grew up, and I didn't think to expect otherwise. Um, I was fairly unprepared. Um, and even to me then, I would say I thought that like terrorists were other people. So it never, ever occurred to me that I could be seen in that light. Um, if anyone here is unfamiliar with that story, I have a hard time gauging these days. But um, basically, at the end of my, my week of wearing my LEDs, I stayed up all night um, to finish a couple of problem sets, like actually until 6 a.m. It's not a good idea, but, you know, undergrads. Um, and uh, at the time, my boyfriend was going to arrive on Friday at about 7 a.m. on the red eye to Boston from California. So I thought, okay, cool. That gives me time for one hour of sleep, and then I will go to the airport and like meet him at the baggage claim, and then we'll head back to campus together. I'll turn in my problem sets, and uh, you know maybe go up to Miters on the weekend and build something. It'll be great. Never have my plans uh, before or since gone so awry. Um, I spent about 15 minutes after getting to the airport to the baggage claim looking around, but it turns out um, my boyfriend didn't actually expect me to get up that early. I was uh, overachieving, as it were and um, he'd already left. So I sort of fruitlessly wandered around, uh, and um, at some point, um, people who worked in the airport um, had noticed the sweatshirt I was wearing and become very unnerved by it and uh, called the police. And um, they arrived uh, brandishing more guns than I'd ever seen before in my life uh, to, um, yell then arrest me, uh, and um, this began, I think, sort of um, the very weirdest day of my entire life. Um, I later learned that I actually, I should say this, um, I actually owe my life to the Boston State Police um, because uh, someone I know got the information that I was actually um, in the sights of a sniper who sort of vaguely saw me walking away from the airport terminal and not towards it and had the thought that that's, that's like not what a terrorist would do. And so I'm able to be here to tell you about this story today. Um, it's also worth noting that in the baggage claim at Logan Airport, at least at the time, you're legally allowed to have up to 11 pounds of ammunition on you as a passenger. I had 13 LEDs. <laughs> um, I was... Um, uh, I had my hands grabbed behind me. Um, I was questioned uh, there on a traffic island in front of the terminal. 
Um, the Boston State Police had very good people respond who, in the course of about five minutes, were able to determine that what I had was harmless. Um, and yet they continued because um, Massachusetts has wrongful arrest laws. So if you arrest someone and it turns out that um, the arrest was wrongful, um, then the police can be sued. So they went ahead and pressed charges and took the case forward, um, even though it was pretty clear pretty early on that there was no uh, threat. Um, before I left questioning, though, before I left the police station, um, MIT elected to issue a statement about what I had done, which is really surprising because, let's be clear, this is a point in time where not even the police felt they had the facts. But MIT, um, sort of the, the bastion of truth and scientific inquiry, elected to say to the press that my actions were reckless and understandably cause for concern. I'll never forget that phrase. Um, I will never really know why MIT elected to make that statement. Um, but it definitely had a tremendous effect. Um, so I spent the rest of my sophomore year attending court cases, um, or court dates, um, and was um, eventually charged with um, possession of a hoax device, uh, which converted into a disorderly conduct charge. I don't know the law very much at all. I certainly didn't know a thing about it at the time. Um, but it turns out that in Massachusetts, um, a hoax device is uh, defined as an infernal machine, which I, like, I wouldn't know what that was if I saw something that was labeled infernal machine at all. Um, and you also have to prove that someone intended to cause alarm to have had one, um, which I certainly didn't. Um, so I was looking at um, maybe going to prison. I had no idea whether or not to take that seriously. I actually went to my professors to ask if they wouldn't mind sending me my problem sets so that I could finish them correspondence in the event that that happened. Um, I was 19. Um, and I think that it's a case where MIT's statement really shaped how people perceived what had happened. Um, for example, for the, the entire rest of that year, I think um, I, less so on campus, but in Boston would encounter people who were at times quite hostile. Um, for example, once I was riding my bicycle through Copley Square, and a man um, came up to, he attempted to push me off of my bicycle, um, and he yelled at me that, um, uh, that I should have done time uh, and that I was stupid, which, like 19-year-olds make mistakes. Um, but he had the full weight of MIT's words behind him, um, which is, I think, part of what made it hurt the most. Um, Sorry, just my notes. I'd say it's been about eight years now since I was arrested, uh, and my life has never been the same. Um, it hasn't been easy, and I'll never know what it might have been. Um, I'll never get all that time back. One of the most surprising things, uh, one of the most surprising outcomes since then is to find just how many people I know who are engineers who've had some experience with the law. It's unbelievable the number of people who've come to me and said, like, look, the same thing happened to me when I was a teenager, when I was in college, a little after. Um, it almost seemed to me like somehow building something that was you know, provocative to others was like a rite of passage for becoming an engineer, which is wrong. It should not be um, effectively criminalized to be curious, to be creative, to build things. Um, I don't think it's okay. I have to wonder if, after all that happened, um, if my experiences were meaningless. Uh, but I don't think so. 
uh, I do think there will be more people like me, um, to borrow a term, the crazy ones. <laughs> Um, the ones who are fostered to do great things um, by having early on the freedom to experiment and explore. Um, there will be more circuits, there will be more clocks, um, more fear as we expand technology. Um, and younger generations who will come up who also want to explore and tinker. I have to wonder too what MIT has learned from this. Um, and. Uh, my advisor, Hal Abelson, uh, who supported me through my case uh, and who only a few, few years after mine uh, would lead the investigation uh, into and write a report on MIT's treatment of Aaron Swartz's case. Um, I was embarrassed and disheartened to read in a footnote in that report that um, what MIT took from what they learned about having made a statement in public in my case was that the best policy was to simply not say anything at all. And I won't go into any more details there, but um, elsewhere it's clear that MIT's choice there, um, again, did more harm than good. I don't believe that no action as a policy is the best policy. It also didn't used to be that way here. Um, in the history of MIT, there's a famous story about a student who uh, elects to uh, pull a little prank at uh, the Harvard-Yale football game, a famous site for MIT students for some reason to uh, pull hacks, as they're called, uh, and who was attempting to, uh, I think, cause a balloon to emerge from the middle of the field that would display the MIT logo, or say MIT on it, during the middle of these you know, other two schools football game. And who, uh, in order to pull this off, needed to wear a coat filled with batteries not even something so scary as LEDs, but actually a trench coat filled with batteries. Um, and who was caught wearing that garment filled with batteries and um, questioned, and who had a dean of MIT turn up to support him, um, also wearing a coat filled with batteries. <laughs> like, oh, you know, you believe that, you know, wearing a coat full of batteries is suspicious? Come on. Um, and the famous phrase is, all tech men wear batteries. <laughs> Destroying any question that, you know, the wearing batteries implicitly made you guilty of uh, causing trouble. It seems so far from the MIT I know today. Um, and that's why I believe that um, what's happening here today is so important. Um, it's amazing to me that MIT hasn't, in recognition of its very special culture, had a way to support legally its students um, uh, seemingly in almost any way at all until now. Um, and it was pointed out to me yesterday too that uh, in, in preparing for this, that here in the Media Lab, we're in a place where you, know, you can build things that are amazing that have never been seen before, but you don't know if you take them outside of these walls whether someone else will be afraid of what you've built and if that happens, whether or not you'll have support from the institution. That seems like something's missing. So what I would like to see is this. Um, instead of when, when things happen, uh, MIT attempting to preserve its reputation by distancing itself from its creative members, that instead it use its full weight of its name to tell the world what it means to be an engineer. And I hope that it also uses um, the you know, power behind its name and that I hope the institution supports this legal clinic in perpetuity.